Aren't you really glad that Jesus loves you? That's like a really profound thing. There was a theologian who was asked, you know, a bunch of brainiacs for questioning him. They said, uh, Doctor, what is the most profound theological truth you've ever pondered in your study of theology? He responded without missing a beat. He said, this one fact, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> God loves you. He's crackers about you. He likes you. That's why he offered his son Jesus for you. Don't you love springtime? Check out these flowers. Aren't they beautiful? I love these flowers. And I love springtime. You know, I have a friend in Portland who uh, sent me a bunch of pictures about, you know, he and his wife went on a walk and looked at all the flowers. Of course, they have a longer growing season. They're cheaters. They have a longer growing season than we do. So their flowers are all up and beautiful and stuff. And ours are coming. But I love flowers. And I especially love roses. I'm kind of a rose guy. Um, but you know what I found about roses? They have thorns. They have thorns. And you start working with roses, and inevitably, you will discover the thorns. Um, and when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, why the thorns? <laughs> Could you explain that to me? I love the flowers. <laughs> the, the, the leaves are okay, too. But why the thorns? Um, you know, Jesus prayed a couple of times, um, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He prayed that, and when he taught us to pray, he said, pray like this, uh, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done as it is uh, on earth as it is in heaven. And he prayed almost that same prayer when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he knew the cross was ahead of him. And he prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cut pass from me. He knew what was coming. He knew exactly what was coming. So he prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cut pass from me. And nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You see, when sometimes when we when we when we find hardship in our lives, when difficult things come into our lives, we start feeling like, oh wow, God doesn't love me. God has forgotten me. God has allowed too much pain in my life. Too many difficulties. Maybe he doesn't love me. Why are there so many thorns in my life? We've got thorns in our life. Um, we've got a son who's going through a divorce, another one who's questioning his walk with God, seriously. We've got a child, a grandchild with cerebral palsy. But you know, God has helped us not to ask why, but to simply say, Father, we know you can heal. We know you can change hearts. The heart of the king is like channels of water and the hand of God turns it wherever he wants. Nonetheless, we thank you for the thorns in our life. Because those thorns have driven us to prayer. <laughs> they have made us come to God and say, God, we have no one but you. We, have, we depend on you. We trust in you. We trust in you because these things we can't fix. We can't change. We pray for change, but it comes when God wants it to. But I learned something about thorns. Thorns have a purpose in our life. I ran across this poem by Martha Snell Nicholson through, my, through a mentor <laughs> of mine whose name is Steve Saint. I don't know. I've never met Steve Saint. I've just benefited from his writings and his videos, but... He's the, the son of Nate Saint, who was martyred in South America in the 1950s. But Martha Snell Nicholson uh, uh, writes this poem that Steve Saint uh, pointed to my attention. 
A mendicant, by the way, it's a, a word we don't often run across. A mendicant is a beggar. The poem goes like this. I stood a mendicant of God before his royal throne and begged him for one priceless gift which I could call my own. I took the gift from out his hand and as I would depart, I cried, but Lord, this is a thorn and it has, it has pierced my heart. This is a strange and hurtful gift which thou hast given me. He said, my child, I give good gifts and gave my best to thee. I took it home, and though at first the cruel thorn hurt sore, as long years passed, I learned at last to love it more and more. I learned he never gives a thorn without this added grace. He takes the thorn to pin aside the veil which hides his face. Got any thorns? Are you whining about it? Are you complaining about it? Or are you simply allowing God through the thorns to pin aside the veil that we might behold his face? Jesus, thanks so much for loving us. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for the thorns in our lives which pin aside the veil that hides your face. Help us to continue to lean hard into you, trust you, whatever may befall us. God is good. Jesus loves us. This we know. a good word, wasn't it? Appreciate your heart, your wisdom, Jim. He is one of the shepherds among us, so thank you for that. At this time, we're going to dismiss the kids, so kids, you are free to go over to Children's Church, so head on out that way and that way. Glad that we have them among us, and glad that you are here among us in this room, in that room, in that room room downstairs, and those of us, those of you who are joining us online, uh, we welcome you as well. So these flowers were not for Jim. He was like, oh, he's giving Jim flowers. I was not. I'm giving them to a, another special lady. So as those kids are going this way, yeah, if Lauren would come up, Lauren Beal. So you know Lauren uh, a number of ways. Number one, you probably recognize her from playing violin up here, and she does that with us and will continue to do that. She also sings and uh, appreciate that gift to us, among other things. And she's bringing up her daughter, Nora, as well. Yeah. And so Lauren has been one of um, our admins at Mosaic and here for the past six months. And she, oh, hello. It's good to see you. She is um, going to a higher calling, and that is being with her kids. <laughs> so she has two children, and so she's been talking some time of how to balance all of her responsibilities here at the church, along with responsibilities at home, along with various things that she does. Came to the conclusion through <laughs> prayer, would you like, should I give these to her maybe? And I'm going to give them to you because they go to you, and then they can probably go to her. Um, you're so cute. Okay, I got to keep focused. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so this was, so she does that. She also does the constant contact and lots of admin stuff. And so she realized, you know, we just can't do all of these things. So with tears and blessings, she said, you know, that during this season, I'm going to have to step away from the admin responsibilities. Still will be singing, still will be playing. And she has been a personal joy to me. And you have benefited from her ministry for a long time. And so we want to recognize Lauren, and we're going to pray for her and launch her into this new season of calling, which is full-time focusing on these two. So why don't, we, why don't we thank her? So And then I'm going to pray for her. Okay, God, thank you so much for this gift to us. 
God, thank you for your grace in Lauren, who has said yes to you. Uh, she said yes to your calling in this place. Hello, <laughs> sweetheart. And thank you for her children and her husband, God, that you have graced her with. Lord, we ask as she launches into this new um, adventure, this new season of her life, God, that she'll feel your peace, she'll feel your grace, she'll feel your love, God, she'll feel your favor. Lord, so we commission her into this next phase. We thank you for her love for you, her love for all of us. Pray that you bless her in every way, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, bless you. All right. Thank you so much, Lauren. Well, today is our official... All eyes are going to be there, so I'll just stop. I get it. Yeah, you cannot compete with that. <laughs> um, today is our official one-half-year-old birthday, so happy birthday to you. We started our first service together on November 2nd, and today, if you do not know, is May 2nd, so happy birthday to us. And, yeah, we, yeah, okay. <laughs> So part of the birthday gift, our leadership council has been talking about, hey, what to do with all of these things. And if you've been waiting for a breath of fresh air, today would be your day, okay? So let me tell you what's happening. So we still have now, we have three different levels of mastedness. Is that a word? Up there in the youth room, that's a, a, a mask-free zone all the time, okay? But when you enter the building... Exit the building, and when we're singing, if you can have your mask on, that would be great. Now, in this space, and in that space right behind us, during the message portion or announcements, if you would like to, you can pull your mask down. And there was great rejoicing in the land. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to, but you can if you so desire. So... So there is that. So we're making that shift at this time, and our policy will continue to look. And then downstairs, those of us who are joining us down there, that is a fully masked uh, zone all of the time. So you have now three options. You can go up there. You can, of course, be here or downstairs uh, with fully masked. And then you know, during, the, during the worship time, we'd ask you to just put them back up because singing apparently causes issues with the virus, and so that would be great, but we can breathe a sigh of relief, those of us who want to do that during this time, so there you go. Um, another update, our dear Sandy Wilson, uh, if you have not received some updates, last week I, I talked about her, and it didn't look really promising at that point. And through prayer and wonderful um, physicians, uh, really something miraculous has happened this week. So they elected to do a surgery, which they thought they would not. They had to go into um, the brain area to relieve some pressure. And uh, I, was, I was there with um, Dave and his daughter when they um, removed, well, they removed the tube, and then we came into the room. And it was just amazing. It, it's just amazing. The tears, and she was communicating the, the best she could at that time. And so she is still recovering over at, over at Swedes, and, uh, but making progress. So this really, truly is a miracle. So we're grateful for your prayers. Just want to update you. Continue to pray for Sandy and Dave and, and the whole family. So it's an amazing thing that we're all grateful for. Okay, that's it for all of those things. If you do have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. We're going again to 2 Thessalonians. So we're looking at the last section. So today is... Uh, the last installment of our series that we've entitled Faith in Uncertain Times. And so through this series, if you've been here with us, we've followed Paul through the Holy Spirit as he is instructing that church and also instructing this church. And they were going through some uncertainties. They were going through difficulties. And they were a new church plant and because the gospel had penetrated that area, there was great resistance. Even Paul and Timothy and Silas and the companions had to flee from that place because of such harsh uh, persecution. And so Paul wrote back a couple times, therefore we have 1 Thessalonians, we have 2 Thessalonians, and his main concern is focused on two areas. He was concerned about their love for one another. And so he wanted to know, are they growing in love for one another, in love for the community? And second, about their faith, if it would grow deep and be established 
in difficult and uncertain times. And he was reassured by Timothy, who was there and came back with a report, and also some other reports that they received, that they were indeed growing, and the gospel was taking root in a new region. And we are to rejoice when the gospel goes to a new re region. And he says, I rejoice, and I thank God for you. And though he continued to instruct these believers, and we saw about prayer and saying, pray that the gospel runs rapidly. Remember that from last week? Pray that the word of God is honored. Pray that the message and the messengers are delivered from evil men. And we learn that we are to pray indeed, and we are to continue to engage yourself with the gospel regardless of our circumstances. In our lives, we indeed also live in times that are uncertain. We don't even know necessarily what will happen to the rest of this day or tomorrow or this summer or into this next fall. We don't know. We know some things, but often things are up in the air. So the question is, what should we focus on? And the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, says continue to grow in love. Continue to grow deeper in faith. And continue to engage yourself in doing good. And so Paul this morning reminds us of those things, but now focuses in on people in that congregation who were idle and disruptive. And encouraging them to continue in their work. So the title of today's message is Work Matters, and work indeed matters. So we're going to go through these last words from the Apostle Paul to us, to that church, as we focus in on what he would have to say to us about how we work, how we live, how we exhibit our faith in times that are uncertain. Okay, so that's where we're going. Excuse me, wow, that was weird. That's where we're going. And by the way, there are notes in the back, so if you're here, and often I go through lots of stuff, if you want to have these notes, they're in the back, they're also online, for those of you who are online. So here is the first big point. This is the instruction. Keep away strong words from those who will not work and will not Listen. So Paul is laying it on here, okay? And we, in turn, need to listen as well, okay? So this is what he says, starting with verse 6 of chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive. And does not live according to the teaching you received from us. So this issue of people in that congregation, even in their context, and in often in so many contexts, is that people were being idle. They were being irresponsible. And because of this, they were being disruptive. And it was an ongoing issue with that church. Now, if you remember in 1 Thessalonians, near the end, okay, this is 1 Thessalonians 5.14, Paul tells them, he says, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Now, you see in this letter that Paul again dresses this, the church about a group of individuals who are persisting to be irresponsible, to be busybodies. We're going to see this by not... Um, engaging with their calling. And so Paul was aware of it. He addressed it and said, hey, warn those people who are doing that. And now in this letter, they must have persisted in this behavior because he's addressing it again. And so he ratchets, ratcheted up their response, right? So he says, hey, keep away from every believer. And you may be wondering, wow, Paul, that's pretty uh, hard, right? Why are you doing that? That does not seem very loving. Because if he was saying that he was primarily concerned about the depth of their faith and the, the length of their love, why would he tell them to disconnect with some people? Because it doesn't seem very loving. 
Well, the truth is that um, instruction, and it's so strong, he says, I command you, okay? The truth is that is loving. It is loving to the person or the people who are exhibiting this behavior, and it's loving to the greater congregation, okay? Now, if you're doing something wrong, and someone loves you, they love you enough to warn you about something, aren't you grateful for that, okay? If I was going in a way, living my faith in a way that did not represent Christ well, okay, those who love me have a responsibility to say, hey, Dave, I love you. I appreciate this, this, and this about you, but right here, that wasn't so good. And so in instructing one another to live in a way that is in accordance to Scripture, okay, living according to the Word is the best way you can live. Thank you. Thank you. Best way you can live. And so these people are to be warned. And they're primarily to be warned about an exhibiting of a behavior that was not in line with the word. And notice that he said that they do not listen to the word. So the root problem wasn't an irresponsi- being irresponsible towards their obligations and their work. That was a result of the real issue. The real issue was that they were not submitting themselves to the word of God. They knew that we are to continue to do good work. They knew that they were continue to grow in love. They knew that they were to use their gifts for the servants of the body. They knew these things because they were written to them in Paul's letters to them. Paul was with them and taught them. So they knew what to do. So this wasn't a matter of ignorance. It was willful disobedience. And that's a whole different deal. Okay? And so they warned them. Because there was a heart issue that was exhibited in a hand issue. Right? Instead of working, they would just become lazy for whatever reason. And start freeloading on the the community of faith. And so that was a problem. So Paul's warning of them and then saying, hey, just separate from them, was loving for them in the hopes that they would realize their behavior was not in a line with the word of God and change so that they would be benefited and the community of faith would be benefited and the greater community would see how the gospel of Jesus Christ changes people. Does that make sense? Okay. So he says separate from them. Which is an uncomfortable thing, right? Warn them and then separate them. And in separating from them, the greater community is benefited and saying, you know what, what you're doing here is not okay. Have you ever been at work and you're working really, really hard and then you have those other people (laughs) that don't necessarily work as hard? How do you feel about that, right? You get a little irritated, a little aggravated. A little frustrated, right? And so Paul's warning that then it was not heeded was turned into, hey, we're going to put some distance here until you change some of your heart by the grace of God. Was not just beneficial to those individuals, but beneficial to the body that says, Body, we love you and respect you enough, and we thank you for working hard. We thank you for coming in early to service. We thank you for operating cameras. We thank you for working in the office. We thank you for greeting people. We thank you for coming to prayer meetings. We thank you for coming to work meetings. We thank you for all of these. Thank you for your sacrifice. And those who just decide to leech, of the goodness and grace of God, said that's not okay, friend. You need to step up. So Paul, because of his love for them and his love for us as a church, said, hey, you need to step into and align yourself with God's word for you and that you are gifted, you are called, be responsive and be responsible for these things. So if people aren't doing that, he says, make some space. And again, that's hard for us to do sometimes. But often, the loving thing to do is tell people the truth. Thank you. But it's not always easy. It's not easy, right? 
but it's loving and it's right and it's true and it's honoring to God. So there is a responsibility both for the individual and the community. It's spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. It is paying attention to God's grace among us and responding to him because we are under his authority and we honor the word. So this is what Paul is addressing in this newfound church, and he's doing it strongly because of the authority and the anointing and the love that he had for that congregation and the love that God has for this congregation. So he says, keep away from those who are not willing to work and will not listen. Do not live according to the teaching you received from us. Now Paul then goes on and talks about, hey, we were examples among you. He says, follow us, look to us and do what we did. So he's not just telling them to do something, but he does it himself, which brings greater authority to what he's saying. This is the next point, follow the example of of the apostles, okay? So he continues on with this theme of warning these people who are being irresponsible and because of their irresponsibility disrupts what the church is doing. This is in verse 7. He continues. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor do we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this, not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. So let's talk about this. Now, the Gospels and the writers of scripture empowered by the holy spirit lived as examples most of the time they were positive examples and sometimes we can learn from people not submitting themselves to god's word and these apostles in their integrity went to places to bring the gospel there as missionaries for the first time now could you imagine paul and timothy and silas washing up or coming on shore to this place called Thessalonica and then setting up, you know, a a little place to communicate the gospel and then having a cover charge for people to get into the church, right? By the way, if you want to hear about the grace of God, it's going to cost you $10, right? He never did that. Did you receive a cover charge when you came into this building today, right? No charge, And when we send missionaries out to bring the gospel in places that have not heard, they don't go there and charge them. They come out of their own accord. They come because people supported them. And you see Paul in so many of his uh, letters, okay, Romans, you see at the end of that, you see this in 1 and 2 Corinthians, that he's asking the established churches to help support him so he can continue his ministry. And this is why we support missionaries. This is why we support pastors. So that they would not have to charge people for ministry. Because things do cost money. The gospel itself, the grace of God is free to us, but it costs. It costs Jesus his very life. It costs these apostles their very lives. And they went through heartache and hardship all the time. And so Paul is saying, hey, when we were with you, we worked hard. We didn't charge you for our food. We didn't charge you for this ministry. We just didn't come in and and do a nice little, you know, air-conditioned, lighted thing for an hour and then, like, had a lap of leisure in our luxury jet. Okay? They worked. 
night and day because they didn't want to burden them and they wanted people to understand how the gospel impacted their life and they came to serve. When we send our missionaries out, we need to support them so that they do not have to charge the people in which God has charged them to reach. When Pastor Key goes out, and he and I had a great conversation this last week, and he goes on these missionary trips, he brings money to the pastors because they're destitute. I've been in India, I've been in Africa, I've been in Ukraine, I've been all over the place. And we don't charge people for ministry because God graces us with the ability to his people in other places. This is what we are to do. And Paul says, hey, you know what? I could have because that's my right. And the gospel does say, the scriptures do say that, you know, those who... um, uh, the laborer, deli- deli- excuse me, the laborer de- deserves his wages, is the first Timothy 5, and those who proclaim the gospel to get their living by the gospel. And so this is what he's saying. We, we could have done that, but we're not. And Paul didn't have a wife, he didn't have children, and he was a tent maker and he worked hard. So this is why he is saying these things to these people. And he says, now this is the rule that we give you. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. That applied to that church, and it applies to this church. Now, there's a difference between being unwilling to work and unable to work. Now, hear me, okay? Sometimes, because of various things, be it lack of availability or lack of ability, that people cannot. That's a different category. This is people who are refusing to work and give themselves over to God's people, becoming a burden to them. Now, you're going to have to um, work hard to convince me that you are unable to work. Okay? For instance, this this last week, okay, Mr. Mario, here's Mario by this pole. Okay, hello, Mario. Mario came up to me on Wednesday night as he was serving in the children's ministry. Pastor Dave, if there's anything that I can ever do for you, let me know. Mario perhaps greeted you here this morning. Mario works in the children's ministry. Mario comes to our Bible study. Mario comes to the prayer meeting. And he asks, Dave, I'll be here anytime you want. Right? Mario also works a job, by the way. Yeah? There's Mario. And so I believe that every person can do something. Being lazy is not a fruit of the Spirit. We are to engage because we are responding to God's grace. We live that grace by loving and working and providing and encouraging and expanding God's ministry among us. Ministry requires work. Your family likes to eat. Okay? Then work. Right? It's upsetting to me in the course of my ministry when employers talk to me about the un truthfulness and laziness of their Christian employees. May it never be. Because we reflect God's grace, because we have his Holy Spirit, because we honor the word, the word says, work unto the Lord regardless of your circumstances. Amen. Right? It would be such a wonderful testimony if we have employers coming in to the back of our service and say, hey, you have anyone here who needs a job? Because I know that if people come from the church, this church, that they're going to work hard, they're going to show up on time, that they're not going to steal, that they're going to tell the truth, that they're going to be honorable because they honor God. Wouldn't that be a good testimony to the community? Come on. I do not want to hear from our employers who are saying, those Christians, yeah, they're freeloaders. So this is an encouragement to you who are working hard and being responsible and hiring people and looking for opportunities. God will give you these things and thank you. Your work matters. 
That's a reflection of God and believing the gospel. Show up, right? Work hard. Talk to people with honor. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Do that. And so Paul is encouraging them and encouraging us. Now, if you have real needs, and there are times in which there are real needs, and we graciously and lovingly love to meet those needs. We have a benevolence fund, and we help that there is a catastrophe. We help if there's a difficulty. There's help if there's unemployment. We help with these things, and we're grateful to do that. But this rule that you do not eat if you do not work is a good rule. I've not always done that rule. I've done it poorly. Back in the day, back in the Mosaic days, we had an event called the Garage Sale Giveaway, right? Which is a beautiful thing. And it started really small. It was like, you know what? We're in a community that has some struggles. So therefore, we want to help meet those struggles. So we're just going to collect stuff, and then we're going to give it away. Okay, let's do that. And so we collected a bunch of stuff. We sorted all this clothes. We went through the shoes. We went all the household stuff. You know the garage sale deal, right? And people heard about it, and they came to our small little building, and it was a pretty cool thing. Well, how much does this cost? Or how much does it charge us to get in? And we were saying, well, it doesn't charge you anything, right? And so we thought, well, that went pretty well. And so we progressed to another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. As word got out, literally in our parking lot during this summer, we had two full-length semis. And those semis were full, and parts of the church were full. And the church was packed with items. We worked, and 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 we worked. And we worked, 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 and we worked. So much so, on the day of our last one, at 5.30 in the morning, people started lining up. And time we opened the doors, at 8 o'clock in the morning, there was a line all the way around the building, and we had 1,300 people come through our building in one day. Right? You say, well, what a powerful impact. No, it was chaos. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. Okay. Right? Now, some people are really grateful. Other people, why, why are you taking that from me? We had fights in our parking lot. We had people stealing stuff from outside. And then selling it down the road. We were hoping to raise the le level of Christianity and compassion. We want to continue to do this. But then we started to read some books and saying, what are we doing here? We do this events, we hardly pray for anybody, and everybody comes, we get mobbed, and we're left with a mess, and it doesn't go well. And we read a book, which I recommend to you, and in, in your notes, if you're interested in these type of things, it's called, When Helping Hurts, How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor and Yourself, Okay. I recommend this book to you. I wish I would have read it 25 years ago. And in it, we recognize that people need to have a buy-in to things. And it's okay to charge in the sense of making people responsible. Number one, it gives them dig dignity. Number two, it makes them understand that, hey, this isn't just free. We're not doing all the work. You get all the benefit. There's a partnership here. And we switch our tactics <laughs> And so we had a hope closet in which we met with people individually and we talked with them and we prayed for them. We didn't just address the current felt need, but the underlying need of what was going on. And so this changed our mindset and it changed even our benevolence policy in recognizing there's people who come through that need immediate assistance, okay, but there's a greater responsibility for people who ask church for assistance. I want to let you know, churches are soft targets because we're typically nice people, right? People know that, and that's okay. But there's a difference between helping people with real needs and then enabling people to be users of God's grace in a negative way. Are you hearing me? Okay. And this is what he's addressing. Okay. So he's saying, hey, if you can work, work. Don't be irresponsible. Don't be disruptive from God's working. 
represent him well. And God, ask him for the grace. God, help me to get up tomorrow. Get three alarm clocks. Work hard. You're doing it because you're honoring God. Your work matters. And then a warning to those who think that they see the church as easy targets and they prey upon it. It's not beneficial to the church, nor is it beneficial to that person. So we work with them, but put some responsibility to them to say, how can you be involved in what's taking place? Does that make sense? So Paul is instructing them and instructing us in this way, giving us this rule, saying, look at ourselves. We work hard, rightly so. We do not need any more self-serving gospel communicators. Dave, you're meddling. Yes, I am. Okay. Guys who cannot fly the friendly skies unless they have their own private jet. It's ridiculous. Guys who go to other countries selling prosperity in the name of God, taking the money from these people who are destitute and going back home in their private jet eating caviar. Not okay. Paul is addressing this, saying, we didn't charge you anything. We didn't take anything from you. We came here to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Follow the examples of the apostles. And some of you are doing this well. Most of you are doing this well. Let us step up our game by the grace of God. Now Paul continues as he's instructing this church out of love. And he gives them and us these three things to focus on. He says, settle down, earn your living, and continue to do good. Settle down, earn your living, continue to do good. Let's read what he has to say, starting with verse 11. We hear... That some among you, here it is again, are idle, lazy, irresponsible, and you cause di- disruption. They're not busy, they are busy bodies. Such people we command, okay, this is strong, and urge. In the Lord Jesus Christ, settle down. (laughs) Earn the food you eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire in doing good. There's a difference between being busy in Production versus a being a busy body and lack of production. It's like a car that moves, okay, there's motion going forward, versus a car who's stuck in the snow. A lot of movement, but very little motion. Okay? And there are people that become busy bodies. That means they're involved in everyone else's business, right? You know people like that. And if you don't know people like that, it might be you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> ha! <laughs> Always in everyone's business, right? <laughs> Always online, doing everything with everybody all the time. Alarmist, right? <laughs> Always up an arm about this thing, and about that thing, and about this thing, and about this, and you hear this, and this, and this, and this. That's not helpful. A lot of energy, a lot of effort, very little forward progress, like spinning your tires and going nowhere. Well, I'm busy. No, you're a busy body. Settle down. That's a word for some of you today. Settle down. It's okay. We're going to make it. Chill out. Instead of putting all your efforts in that direction, do something productive. Right? If you need something to do, come talk to me. <laughs> I'll introduce you to my fine friend, 
friend, Fred friend, see what I did? Fred, Fred. Wow, what am I saying? Friend, Fred. Dave, take another drink. Of water, thank you, goodness. What you got in that cup, buddy? <laughs> Settle down. Earn the food you eat. And there have been times when we launched um, Mosaic. I don't know how we're going to pay the bills. But I trusted God. God, will you provide me, here's the word, employment? Will you provide my needs? He always did. Was it always work I wanted to do? No. Was I grateful for it? Yes, I was. Work, Dave. I work. I work continue to work. If you're in that place, God, help me to earn these things. And as for you, brothers and sisters, bless you who are doing this, and so many are you are. Never tire of doing what is good. For in the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Galatians. Work is tiring, right? And by the way, God gave us work before sin entered the world. God himself is a worker, and God instructed the first com- couple to work. Did you see this in Genesis? Right? Work is not a curse. It could be a blessing. We say amen, right? Satisfying work is a blessing. Scripture tells us these things. Toil comes in because of the curse. Weeds grow, right? Because of the curse. But we're told to work. 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 Make a difference. When our kids were at home, often as they went off to wherever they were going, I'd tell them to go mad. Go mad today. Now, was I telling them to get angry? No. Mad. Make a difference today. Go mad. Make a difference today. It's not about how people treat you, it's about how you are treating people, right? I tell students and I tell our kids as they're growing up, learn what you have the privilege. Come on, teachers. Come on, students. Learn what the privilege you have to learn. Learn it so that you can be equipped, so that you can help somebody. Don't do it because you want an A. Don't learn your studies. Don't do it because you just want to get over this class. Right? Learn. Give yourself. Do it. Why? So that you'll be equipped. Why? That you can make a difference. It's why we learn. Not about getting a good income. I don't tell them that. Don't go to school to get a good job, to get a good income, to have a good job so you'll be comfortable so that you can retire and collect seashells. Forget it. Be equipped so you can glorify God through your work and your ministry in the world. I'll get on board on that. Right? Two more things and we'll come in for a landing. <laughs> so he continues going forward. He continues out of love and through grace to encourage people. Never tire in doing what is good. Continue to do what is good. And then he returns again. He says, hey, warn. He tells them again, disconnect but those who do not obey the word. Verse 14. Take special note. <laughs> Paul, you're being a little legalistic here. No, he's being loving. He's saying, hey, pay attention. To what? Well, to anyone who does not obey our instructions in this letter. Do not associate with them. 
in order that they may feel ashamed. And we're going to talk about that. Okay. Yet, do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. So first it starts with a warning, okay? And notice the warning is about people who do not obey the word. And there are people in churches who get away with horrendous sin because those in the know didn't say anything. There are pastors who, who preach. There are worship leaders who lead. There are children's workers who work there. But with the erosion of compromise, right? You like that? Erosion of compromise, a little by little, a little by little, a little by little. There's an undermining of obedience to the word which just, at a certain point, the whole house of cards topples. And the worst thing about that is the name of Christ is compromised. It's horrendous for that individual. It's horrendous for those connected to them. Don't get me wrong. But the worst thing about it is those in the outside and saying, hmm, look at those Christians. They ain't any different than any of us. You know what? They're kind of even worse than us. That's bothersome. And so he says, hey, pay attention. Right? Again, this is not legalism. This is love and honoring the word of God. Pay attention to those who aren't following God's word and encourage them and warn them. If they say, no, I ain't going to do that. No, I'm going to continue to be lazy. Hey, you know what? No, I'm going to continue to abuse or abandon people. Hey, no, I'm not going to do that. He says, hey, put some space between you. Why? So that they'll feel ashamed. What does that mean? It's not being shamed, and that's different. Not shame on you. It's creating space because you love them and it hurts you. In order that they would recognize that what they're doing is not okay, not accepted, so that they would turn from their behavior. That's what the Greek word means. I've had to do, do this with people. I don't do this because I like it. <laughs> and I do it because, oh, I don't like you. You, bleh, get out of here. Broken hearted. You need to change. This isn't okay. Hey, you need to change. This isn't okay. And there's this a separation. Why do you do that? Because you don't love the person? No, no, you do it because you love the person. In hopes that they would say, man, I want to be a part of the community of faith. Often in our context, they'll just go to a different church. And there's good reasons to go to a different church, and there's bad reasons. And the truth is, everywhere you go, there you are. <laughs> and if you bring your problems with you, you're going to create more problems regardless of where you are. It's best to deal with these things. Say, God, what are you doing? What are you saying? What are you calling? So he says, warn and disconnect, right? Here's the last thing. Right from the text, the last point. So Paul, as he wraps up his letter, and as we wrap up this series, I want to again encourage you. So many of you are doing so well. Okay? Continue to grow in love. Continue to honor the word of the Lord. Continue to pray that the gospel goes forward. Continue to reach out into the community. Continue to do good. Continue to be responsive and responsible and move forward. And Paul prays for them and he prays for us to receive the peace and the grace of our Lord. And again, we want to be a congregation that grows in grace, that grows in peace, that deepens in faith. 
and is effective to the nations of the world. Obedience of faith to bring about for the sake of his name among all the people, starting with your neighbor, friend. This is where we're going. This is what we're doing. And he encourages us. The Holy Spirit is helping us. Receive the grace and peace of the Lord. This is how he ends his letter. Now may the Lord of peace. Do you like that? It's one of his titles. He's a king of kings, and he's also the Lord of peace. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace. That means the source of peace is in your circumstances. It's Jesus himself. May the Lord of peace give you peace from himself. Peace be unto you. At all times, even when you're stressed out, yeah. Even when you wonder about your job, yeah. Even if you wonder about your health, yeah. Even if you wonder about your finances, yeah. When all times may your peace not come from your circumstances, because if you're waiting for your peace to come there, you're going to rarely get it. The best place to receive peace is from the Prince of Peace. This is his prayer. May the Lord himself give you peace. Don't receive it, God. I need your peace right now. All times, in every way, the Lord be with all of you. The number one response in Scripture to people who are afraid is that God is with you. That's the comfort. But Jesus had to go away so the Holy Spirit would come on us and in us and be with us. The comfort is not that everything will go well. The exact opposite is true. Often it will not go well. The comfort is that the God of peace will be with you. He will not abandon you. He will not forsake you. He has your name written in the palm of his hand and no one's going to snatch you out. It's not about your grip on him. It's about his grip on you. The faithful one will not abandon you. I'll be with you to the end of the age. The Lord be with all of you. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand because there was forgeries out there saying, hey, this is me, which is the distinguishing mark of all my letters. This is how I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You cannot do these things on your own, okay? So relax. And trust that the God of peace, the God of grace will strengthen you. So I'm going to pray for us, and the musicians are going to come up. And I want you to receive the peace and grace of our Lord wherever you are. And remember these things today that we would be responsive to God, that we would be responsible to each other. And as we pray and as we sing, I want you to think about this, okay? I'm going to ask God, and you've been prayed for today, right? Nine o'clock prayer meeting, you're all invited. That continues to grow. We're praying that God's presence would be here. I pray that all of our hearts would be open today, that we have ears to hear, I know God is speaking to us. The question is, are we listening? So let's join together in prayer. Let's do that right now. So God, here we are, your people, scattered in this building and scattered in different places around this planet this day. God, we gather because we believe. God, I thank you for open hearts, God. I thank you that we have your word and I ask God that we would honor you by honoring your word. That we'd have ears that hear, we have eyes that see what you're saying, what you're doing, what you're calling. 
that we'd understand your peace based in you. And God, we ask for grace. God, I ask for grace for those who are suffering right now. And it is difficult. Grace, grant your grace to them. God, I ask for grace for those who are worrying. Grace. God, I ask for grace for those who are so tired. Fill them new today. And God, I ask for grace for conviction. For those who are just gotten sloppy and irresponsible and unresponsive, convict God. Change hearts, we ask. Thank you for the work in this congregation and the congregations throughout the world who are looking to you. We think of our me and my friends at this day are worshiping in a jungle because they've been forced out of their homes for fear of their life. God, have mercy, we pray. Be with our Myanmar congregation this day as they gather in this place today at 1 o'clock. Fill this place anew with your presence, God. Be with Pastor Key, those leading worship. Bless them, we pray. Encourage them, we pray. Strengthen Help us not to become complacent in doing good. Thank you for your empowering presence with us here. In Jesus' name, amen.